Hello out there, everyone. This is Dr. Jax, and welcome back to our class here in Infrastructure Hardware One. We are in week two, and this is your second class for the week. If you haven't seen week two, lecture one, bounce back and check that one out. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, storage system environment and the uh, concepts that go along with that. And just as a brief reminder before I get started, remember that we needed to do three lectures this week to catch up. So this is our second of three lectures. Tomorrow morning, I'll be doing another lecture. Let me see if I posted the time on that. Give me just a second. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the computer is really slow. Um, I just want to make sure I posted the right time. And uh, let's get that going here. All right, so nine o'clock in the morning central time. Yes, it is posted. It is in the announcements. So I hope to see you guys tomorrow morning as well. But uh, if there are any questions about anything as we move along, you are encouraged to shoot me messages. And if you uh, want to see some more of something or some less of something, uh, let me know. I want to ensure that uh, we get the content covered for you guys as best we can. What I try to do is uh, observe what we're looking at in the ebook, and I touch on some of the information in the ebook, but uh, probably the majority of it will come from other sources, so I can kind of flesh out your experience here. And you can read the rest of the chapter in the ebook to uh, catch up on that. And that information. And I encourage you guys to go through the LMS, do the quizzes, do all the interaction stuff, and uh, that will really help kind of flesh out your experience here and help you get the most out of it. And I also have been wanting to say about some of the deliverable content. So you'll be getting opportunities to do uh, Word documents and PowerPoint documents. And something that I see in PowerPoints a lot of times is that uh, some of you are overwhelming the information. So I want to encourage you guys when you do a PowerPoint presentation to take the time to show the information as briefly as you can on the slides do three or four points on the slide and use the lecture notes down below to flesh out your description so if you put 20 lines of content on the slide you're going to make your readers eyes glass over and they're going to lose interest and so what i want to encourage you guys to do is to briefly state your points and maybe include a graphic if it's needed but Put lecture notes at the bottom or if you want to uh you can include a, a word document or something to to flesh out the explanation uh if you put a whole bunch of minutia with a tiny font that i can't read it's going to affect your overall grade so keep that in mind and i hope that uh, that helps you guys if you want resources good templates for slides let me know i can point them towards you so without further ado, let me go ahead and get the presentation pulled up and we'll get that going. So it looks like no one else is popping in, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Today we're talking about servers and server environments. So let's review a server is any computer that provides services and a client is the computer that requests those services. A network is made up of servers and clients, and it is known as a client server network. Now, a server we often think of in terms of the larger, um, more complex switches and nodes, but you can actually build a PC as a server and run smaller computers off of it in a server client network. Really, what it boils down to server client features are just configurations. A server based network is the best network for sharing resources and data while providing a centralized network security for those resources and data. In a server based network, you can be offline in a localized facility operating as a silo or it can be connected to the Internet. Networks using Windows Server are typically client server networks. Let's talk a little bit about server roles. Windows servers use roles to define what services the server provides. 
It could be any number of roles. Uh, we got some listed here. A server can have multiple roles like file services, web services, and directory services. Now, when you are determining the hardware and software needs, you have to look at the role. It is part of what informs the decision. It tells you what the computer, computer needs to fill and the load the computer will be placed under. When selecting server hardware, you want to keep some things in mind. For one thing, performance is important. Servers are intended to provide network performance to many users. And you want to keep in mind the size of the database, the type of the data, and how readily it needs to be accessed in order to choose the server hardware. Additionally, you want to make sure that the availability needs are met. If a server fails or becomes unavailable due to a lack of redundancy or whatever the issue may be, it can affect multiple people. Sometimes stakeholders that are involved in a large project can suddenly be floating blind without any help if the availability needs are not met. And of course, one of the biggest things is cost. How can you balance your available budget with the physical needs of the goals and the performance and availability? So keep those things in mind whenever choosing server hardware. Another option at your fingertips is virtual servers. Now, virtual servers or virtual machines can enable the operation of multiple operating systems and they can run concurrently on a single machine. I've actually done this to deal with the issue of a client server network that involved a newer laptop that couldn't talk to older nodes. The older nodes were based on a proprietary system, not proprietary, but older Windows systems that were compatible with up to Windows 7. And so what we could do is build a virtual server and within that virtual server run a partitioned operating system that's older like xp or windows 7 and use it to sort of trick the system into thinking that an older computer was talking and interfacing with the node virtual servers basically allow for the separation of services by placing them in partitions so that changes in one virtual server have no effect on the operation in other servers Virtualization offers a better way to utilize hardware since most hardware is actually sitting idle most of the time. So you can run multiple OSs. You don't even have to run the same brand. I've seen people run Windows and in a virtualization system set up Linux or a Mac. Another decision to make is the location of the server. So after you've selected the server, all the configuration, all the components and the licenses, you will need to determine where to physically locate the server. And some thought goes into that based on different factors. The server room is the work area of the information technology department, which contains the servers and most of the communication devices, including switches and routers. The room should be secure with only a handful of people allowed to have access to it. Software contains the instructions that the hardware follows, which make the computer do what it does. Software provides you an interface that can help you configure and manage the computer. So when you configure the server, the first thing you want to do is select and install and then configure the operating system if it's not built in. Then install and configure the services that the operating system provides. It will vary depending on the use and the needs of the system. And install and then configure any additional software needed on the server. Now I mentioned roles earlier. A software server provides services. A Windows server has organized the most common services into server roles. Now, a server role describes the function of the server. A Windows server features are basically software programs that are not directly part of the role. Server features serve to augment the functionality of 
one or more roles, which enhance the functionality of the server. So for a full installation, what you do, starting with Windows Server 2008, you can install Windows on uh, one of two modes, which are generally involved in uh, the installation DVD. There's the full version, the server core, and the full installation has a fully functional GUI interface and supports installation uh, of all available server roles and other Microsoft third-party software. There's no guesswork involved. It's all inclusive. Now, in server core installation, it differs because it provides a minimal environment with no Windows Explorer shell, and it only supports certain server roles. So depending upon the needs of the organization and the budget, that might be the way to go. There are different types of installations. Uh, one we want to talk about here is the clean installation. Now, in dealing with the servers, a clean installation basically installs the operating system to a new directory. And you will select clean installation in certain situations. Uh, in one, uh, no operating system has been installed yet on the computer. For the installed OS does not support the installation or upgrade that might lead to the need for a clean install. Or you might need to configure a multi boot configuration. A clean installation is actually preferred. All right, performing a clean install of an OS can be the preferred method because all the files are installed again. So if something becomes corrupt or broken in some way, you can perform a backup of all necessary systems and do a clean install and start fresh. The disadvantage to doing this is that all the software needs to be reinstalled, all the third party information, all the extra patches and everything, uh, and the data and the configurations need to be set all over again. So it's important to document all changes going along as you uh, change configurations or do alterations. So you might be looking at a project that actually takes hours or even days to accomplish. So if you're doing a clean install and it's not a redundant system, you're in a little bit of a jam. Maybe you're performing an upgrade rather than a clean install. So in some instances, you want to take the current system and upgrade from an older version of Windows. You cannot perform an in-place upgrade from a 32-bit to 64-bit, by the way. You can perform, excuse me, you can perform an upgrade when you want to keep the current configuration on the computer. Excuse me for a second. Throat strike. One of the things that you have at your disposal to uh, create redundancy is disk cloning. Now, disk cloning, like the name implies, it takes the contents of the computer or the hard disk rather, creates a copy and puts it on another disk or an image file, like an ISO. Disk cloning is a sector by sector copy of the contents of the hard disk. It enables you to capture customized Windows image that can be reused. The Windows Server can be installed using disk cloning. And disk cloning creates an exact copy of an operating system installation, which can be a problem for computers on a network. Let's talk about SysPrep. So if Windows installation is cloned, each target computer using the same image will have the same parameters, including the same computer name and security identifier. So for these computers to operate properly without a conflict on the network, each of these parameters have to be unique, so some adjustments, adjustments must be made. To overcome this, you can use SysPrep. The benefits of SysPrep are it removes any system-specific data from Windows, and it configures Windows to boot to audit mode, and it configures Windows to boot to Windows Welcome and it can reset the Windows product activation. You can also do an unattended installation. Unattended installation can enable you to actually automate the configuration and the deployment of operating systems. 
an answer file is used to perform an unattended installation of Windows. An answer file is basically an XML file that stores all the answers for a series of graphical user interface or GUI dialog boxes. When those prompts come up, the answer file can actually respond. And you can use any text editor, notepad or what have you, to create and modify the answer file. The server image manager can also be used. The server image, man server image manager looks like this. Windows deployment service. This is a technology from Microsoft for network based installation of the Windows operating system. The Windows deployment services is updated and redesigned uh, version of the RIS or remote installation services because sometimes you might need to engage an update from uh, another location, either operating from your location or having an IT department that's remote actually work in. That's where the WDS comes into play. The deployment of Windows can be fully automated and customized through the use of an unattended installation scripting file. It does have some benefits. That includes uh, it allows for the network based installation of Windows based operating systems. It deploys Windows images to computers without operating systems. And uses standard Windows setup technologies, things like Windows PE, WIM files and image based setup. And creates images using a reference computer using the image capture wizard. Now I mentioned WIM. The WIM is a Windows image format file. Windows installation files can be distributed within a Windows imaging system. The WIM is a file based imaging format that Windows Server uses for rapid installation on new computers. WIM files store copies, which we call images of the operating system. And keep in mind Windows licensing is important. The licensing is a software license purchased from the software company like Microsoft that grants you permission to use a specific software package. It can be specific to the number of users and what machines could be on. Most licenses from corporations like Microsoft work more like a lease rather than a purchase of actual software. Now, years ago, the licensing was configured into the cost of the computer. Windows OS had Word and all the different uh, programs built into the OS. You didn't have to license them separately. Today, it's a different story. Licenses are typically purchased for a specific number of users and usually over a time period like a year. An activation can occur over the network automatically. So Microsoft product activation is effectively an anti-piracy technology designed to verify that software products are legitimately li legitimately licensed. Say that 10 times fast. Uh, not long ago, when you bought a new hard drive off of the internet, it came pre-configured, had Windows on it, and you just registered either through the mail or you could go on the internet and register. But that is a thing of the past. Product activation is sometimes included in new technologies. And it involves a key. A product key is required to activate the product. It can be purchased on the Internet digitally. And uh, entered manually like that. And uh, Windows updates can help keep your computer safer. And your software current by fetching the latest security and feature updates from Microsoft. It is encouraged to keep those updates. Constant because as new threats are discovered, workarounds are built, patches are made. So if you're not interested in manually updating, then set up an automatic updater every night, maybe at midnight uh, or whatever your organization is not as busy. So after installing Windows, run the Windows update to apply fixes, install patches, server packs, device drivers, anything that's needed. Automatic updating can be enabled to download and install important updates as they become available. 
you can have it set up to check every so many days if you wish. Let's take a look at some information from module two, managing the Windows Server. We've talked a little bit about configuration, but we haven't gone very far down that rabbit hole. So in server configuration, you have initial configuration tasks. Now the initial configuration task utility automatically launches when you first log on to Windows after the installation. You provide the computer information, updates to the server, and customization. The control panel is the graphic utility that you can use to configure the Windows environment and hardware services and devices. You've no doubt uh, accessed the control panel many times to install a new printer or a mouse or anything else. It works the same way in server configuration. You can set up configurations for the system and security, networks and internet, all the protocols, the hardware, any programs that come in, user accounts, appearance, customization, clocks, language, region, everything. Additionally, you want to set up the user accounts. So in user account control or UAC, that is a feature that has uh, been around for a long time. It started with Windows Vista and is still uh, being used years later. And it helps to prevent any unauthorized changes to your computer. UAC is a security component that enables users to perform common tasks like uh, basic changes to the uh, configuration without going into a situation where it can harm other users on the network. It uses uh, an account that's not an administrator level account or uh, it, you're not in a situation where it has to be switched back and forth. Before performing actions that could potentially affect your computer's operation or changes, to uh, settings that can affect other users, you have to be logged in as an administrator. The UAC will ask for your permission. And if you're logged in as a standard user, UAC asks you for an administrator password. It adds an extra layer of protection that helps to uh, keep the system running. Now in the system settings, some of the most important configuration settings for your servers uh, administrators are the system settings within the control panel and the settings include things like gathering information about the system, changing the computer name, adding the computer to a domain, accessing the device manager, configuring remote settings, and configuring startup and recovery options, as well as configuring overall performance settings. You can also set up work groups and domains. Now, work group is associated mostly with the peer to peer networks. That's where user accounts are decentralized and stored on each individual computer. A domain is a logical unit of computers that define a security boundary, and it is often associated with the Active Directory Domain Services, or the ADDS. Domain security is centralized and controlled by Windows servers acting as domain controllers. For remote assistance and remote desktop, you can access a computer running Windows with another computer that is connected to the same network or over the internet as long as permission settings are there, just as if you were sitting in front of a remote computer. You will be able to use your mouse and keyboard to access the desktop, taskbar, and start menu. You'll be able to run programs and access all the configuration tools. This is both a best case and uh, also a worst case scenario because uh, I've actually come across hackers or maybe not a hacker, but someone who tried to access my machine uh, through remote assistance. They were asking for help with an application and I was providing support and they tried to convince me after a while that they could better understand if they could see my screen. But the, to do so, they wanted to use a system that takes my IP address and theirs and does a handshake and uh, allows for some control. And of course, I, I shut that down quickly because I can communicate something to someone by providing images and video of my screen, but I'm not going to grant 
access to the controls. So remote assistance, be, be cautious with establishing that and keep it within the organization, keep it with people and uh, groups that you are familiar with. All right, so to do that, you have to have a knowledge of IP addresses and understand those settings. So you can configure the following on a computer running Windows Server. You can set up IP addresses and the corresponding subnet mask, and that uniquely identifies the computer using a logical address. Now with the IP address, you can generally get information about a location, but not a specific physical address, although it gets you in the vicinity a lot of times. So IP addresses can provide geolocation services. MAC addresses are addresses that are different because they're specific to your device. So on a network, in a peer-to-peer -peer network internally, if you have a MAC address, you can send the information to that computer. But to do it across the country, you'd need both the IP and the MAC. All right, the default gateway is the router that connects the other networks to or the internet. The DNS server that provides name resolution. The IP address, subnet mask, default gateway and DNS servers can be configured manually or automatically via the DHCP that we talked about. You should be familiar with device drivers. That is a component that enables Windows to interact with a device. Device drivers are basically little pieces of software that communicate between your OS and your hardware. Think about when you uh, installed the latest mouse, a device driver automatically came up and loaded from the internet. So although Windows Server includes many drivers built in or included, some drivers come with the device. To prevent you from constantly inserting the Windows Server installation DVD, Windows Server includes a driver store with an extensive library of device drivers. Other hardware resources include the how the Windows assigns system resources to the devices you're installing so that the device can operate at the same time as other devices. Devices communicate with the system using the following hardware resources. IRQ, which is interrupt requests used to access the device. DMA channels or direct memory access. This enables certain components within the device to access system memory without using the CPU or central processing unit. Input output or IO port addresses that allows for communication between the CPU and the hardware devices. And memory address ranges. This is a range used by the device to access the computer's primary storage memory. And PNP, plug and play devices as the name implies. This technology provides a combination of software and hardware support that enables Windows operating systems to detect and configure hardware automatically. The PNP installs the appropriate driver after the hardware is detected. Plug and play manager works by performing the following steps. One, verify the hardware resources the device requires, the memory, the IO, the DMA channels and so forth. Two, Verify the hardware identification for the device and install and configure the appropriate driver. And three, if multiple, if, if multiple device drivers are found, then the driver that most closely matches the hardware is selected. And four, the driver is then installed and the OS starts the device. And usually, even though this sounds like a lot, it happens fairly quickly, within seconds. Sign drivers, Microsoft started using sign drivers to help to mitigate faulty device drivers. A sign driver includes a digital signature, which is an electronic security mark that can indicate the publisher of the software and information that can show if a driver has been altered. All drivers running on a 64-bit version of Windows must be signed before Windows will load them. This adds an extra layer of security and prevents unauthorized access or corruption. The Windows Server is now delivered only in 64-bit versions. All drivers need to be signed for anything after Windows 2008. But the Device Manager is a tool in Windows Server that is used to manage all the hardware devices. It can install and update drivers 
and hardware devices, change the hardware settings, troubleshoot problems, and when diagnosing problems with the device manager, a, uh, a down black arrow indicates a disabled service. A disabled device is a device that is physically present and it's consuming resources, but it lacks a driver. Maybe you've seen it when you put a piece of hardware on your system that is a newer system, but older hardware, and it doesn't recognize it. A black exclamation point in a yellow field indicates the device is in a problem state. And you also need to check whether any devices are listed under other devices or have a generic name like Ethernet controller or PCI simple communications controller, which could indicate that a proper device driver was not found and loaded. Now the server core installation provides a minimal environment with no window shell for running specific server roles and there's no start button. Server core could be managed locally at a command prompt or remotely by using the remote desktop services. You can also manage the server remotely using administrative tools based on the Microsoft Management Console or MMC, including computer management and server management controls. So that is about all we're going to cover for today. Tomorrow we're going to be picking up and we will continue this conversation. Let's see, tomorrow's topic is going to be uh, data protection and RAID. So we're going to go into some uh, tricks that we can use for parallel architecture and we can actually uh, get a better picture of what uh, redundancy looks like. So that's about it for now. If you guys have any questions about anything, shoot me a message to dax.bradley at rasmussen.edu. You can give me a call or text at 252-458-7176. Keep those deliverables coming in. Keep writing good content. Ugh, my brain is my brain and my mouth are not communicating well tonight. So I need to uh, run a run a device driver on my mouth. All right. So we'll talk to you guys next time. Uh, see you in the morning, bright and early. Get the coffee ready. All right.